Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is game eight from the 2023 World Chess Championship match. Dinglerin has the white pieces in this one and trails three to four. Let's have a look. Another d4 game. We've had we had this position in game three, Nipomnishi with white. And he was welcome to Dinglerin playing the Nimzo Indian. Dinglerin in game three played the Queen's Gambit declined, went with d5. So both players are welcome to this bishop b4 move, and we see that in this game eight for the first time. Nimzo Indian defense on board. e3, castles, a3, bishop takes knight. We have the Zamish variation of the Nimzo Indian. In a way similar to game four, Regarding imbalances, doubled C-pawns, bishop pair for white. Game four, Ding Lirin went on to win, playing with the white pieces. Okay, from here, d6, black stays strong on the dark squares. Ties in well with the light square bishop. Temporary stop on e2 for the knight. It wants to go to g3. It wants to stay out of the f-pawn's way. This guy is still free to move. Given time, white could look to form a very intimidating center. Maybe look forward to pressing with e5. If black is ever playing e5 with the pawn on f4, there's the possibility to capture and push. This knight has an eye on the f5 square in the event this pawn moves. Okay, from here it's knight c6. And now, as Ding Lirin pointed out in the press conference, Rook A2, a deep move. What is this guy looking to do? It's not 100% clear to me right now. Um, we're not quite sure where this guy is going to go next. Uh, if things sharpen in the center, maybe it can find a useful role in the center. Doing something on the D file. But... There's also other squares that can open up for the rook. So I was already pointing out the f-pawn may advance. Maybe the rook goes to f2 in some lines. And strangely enough, <laughs> this rook may also look to one day get to h2. Now, how in the world is that possible? Well, pawns need to be cleared out of the way. I will be highlighting a couple lines where this rook ends up over here on h2, oddly enough. <laughs> okay. As mentioned, it is some deep move. Okay, from here, b6, e4, bishop a6. This guy is weak. Given time, it could be tracked down. It could be hit more than it is defended. What is white going to do in the meantime? How to stir up trouble and distract black from simply gobbling up the c4 pawn one way or the other? Let's see. He has a fishing pole idea up his sleeve. Bishop g5. If you do not question this bishop right now, you're going to get hurt. For example, rook c8, knight h5. Your king's side is soon going to be destroyed. Okay. So, h6, necessary. Bishop move is going to be losing. Capturing the knight, withdrawing the knight. What's the idea? H4. 12 moves in. This is an extremely important position. Okay. What do you do now? You capture the bishop, move played in the game. H takes G. You are now up a piece is black, but it's important not to try and hang on to that material. Important to give it right back. The H file is now opened. If you try to save the knight, your king is going to get mated. Queen H5, the square you have given up as soon as you move the knight. How do you stop mate? F5, G6, mate next. You have to flick that one in first to delay it. Okay. Don't try and save the knight. G6. Now this knight's maybe ready to go. h5 is under control by the pawn. So now pawn takes knight. Queen takes pawn. No reason not to take that pawn straight away. If for some reason you're trying to flick this one in first, 
this pawn lives after e5 and knight to e4. And next up, we have queen c1, queen h6. There are other ways why I could try to get the queen to the h file. Can't get here directly, but could take two moves to get to h6. Mate next. Okay, queen takes f6 straight away. And now e5. I really like this idea. You know, this knight on g3, how did it get there? Two tempi have been invested in order to get the knight on g3. And from this post right now, what is it doing? Doesn't have a good forward move. So how do you justify its position? How do you make it make sense? You go with e5. You are opening up a forward move for the knight. He has e4 now. D takes e5. D5 is the follow-up. White is going with D5. He's creating a passed pawn. The knight doesn't have to move necessarily right now. Their idea is to pin the pawn first, but he goes with knight e7 straight away. In comes d6, officially passed. Knight f5. And knight to e4. Now, I want to go back for a moment and highlight this idea of rook to h2. So in this position right here, instead of d5, the move played in the game, move 16, d5, suppose that this knight immediately makes use of e4. Queen f4 can follow, and this is where we could see white clearing the way for the a2 rook. He can start first by defending the knight, and next playing g3, in this case with tempo. And Nearby, we have rook h2. This is considered some equal position. It is really messy, but this is one way we could see the rooks one day being stacked on the h file. Okay. In this game, it's first d5, d6, and only then knight e4. Queen goes back home. She is hit. And now from here, queen d3. Black now must find an only move. And he does. King g7. Why is that an only move? What's wrong with, let's say, challenging an invasive knight? Well, queen h3. How are you stopping, mate? Black would have to give up a piece. And note, we are there in the end defending the knight. So, what does king g7 do? It prepares to meet queen h3 with rook h8. All right. From here, it's g4. The knight doesn't move, shouldn't move. Another important point. Move 20, he finds it. Bishop b7. He's prepared to meet pawn takes knight with e takes f taking away from the center keeping this guy as a shield still for the king and now there's this pin this is considered winning for black so white does not bite on f5 instead gets out of the pin and from here knight h4 queen's defending the knight g5 no longer defending the knight so he's cutting off the defense of the knight with g5 and creating a pivot for the knight on f6. Now, this is an extremely important point in the game. How exactly do you cope with this threat against the knight? Also, how are you dealing with the knight maybe jumping into f6? The move played is bishop takes knight. Now, all of a sudden, white is winning. Black needed to find the only move, which is rook to h8. And I'd like to highlight how play could follow if this move was spotted. This is how white can follow up. f4, and I'm purposely showing this line because we get to see this guy sliding over to h2 again. And this one, this one would end in a, a very pretty way. E takes f4, knight f6, this is how the line goes, e5, rook h2, and now we have this knight f3 check. How are we dealing with this is white? 
Well, this one would end as a draw. <laughs> you have to give up the queen for the knight. And in the end, what's happening? It's going to be a perpetual check. King f8, rook h8. King g7, rook h7. And we keep going just like this. Taking the queen, we're going to be down the exchange in the end. A really neat <laughs> line where we sacrifice the queen. And again, we get these rooks stacked on the h file. Yeah, really interesting ideas here. As he mentioned, very deep idea with rook to a2. It's just another line where that could maybe show up. So this was considered best. Rook to h8. Another move is knight to f5. So what's wrong exactly with knight to f5? Well, it's f4. And what are we doing now? If you capture the pawn, another case where this rook gets here and it's big trouble for team black. So knight f5 is no good. Rook h8 was best. He did not find it. He ends up capturing the knight. So there's no worry about the knight jumping into f6 in this case. Queen takes bishop. Only now, knight f5. And from here, maybe he had only calculated queen takes e5 check. But a very strong move now by Ding Lirin. He is not so quick to take on e5. He ends up, he ends up playing to d2. Defending d6. This pawn is poison. In the game, rook h8 is played. So I'd like to point out, instead of rook to d2, if you're capturing on e5, black has f6. g takes f6, queen takes f6. Things are cozy here for black. He has defended. He's ready to offset the rook. So taking straight away really isn't getting white anywhere. It's first rook d2, supporting the pass pawn. This guy is poison. Taking it now, we take on e5 check and we win the knight. So in the game, it's rook to h8. Some other try. What's happening if queen takes g5? We can take on e5 with check. If you block with the queen, you're going to get deflected. And white will be winning the queen. So you would have to play f6. And now queen to h2. This rook is ready to come into h7. White is now winning. Okay. So this move must have been missed. Goes into a bit of a think here. Spends about 7 minutes. Plays now rook to h8. Rook takes rook is best. Queen takes rook. And now a second best move is played. And that is d7. So even stronger is the move rook to d3 in this position. This rook has taken quite the journey. Rook up to a2, d2, rook d3 in this position. What is the intention to play to the h file? It is supported by the bishop, who has yet to move. These guys are just hanging out. The king and bishop, 26 moves in. What do you do about rook to h3? Computer saying you really can't do too much. Also note, the queen can't go too far. With this queen not capturing on e5 straight away, she's staying trained on this rook. So trying to move the queen forward, you're, you're losing the rook. What do you do? The computer says if white plays rook to d3, there's rook to d8, rook h3, and it's already suggesting to give up the queen for the rook. Some other move, like queen to f8, allows white to take on e5 with check. And if the king moves, we're going to have mate in the corner. And if you play f6, we could again have a situation where white wins the queen with the deflection tactic. Rook h7, queen takes queen. So this would have been a very nice move in this position. Move 26, rook up, and then over get to that h file. In the game, he pushes the passed pawn one step away from queening. Rook d7 follows. Queen takes e5 only now. 
king h7 we repeat a couple moves this is a very good uh, decision here by white looking at the clock times roughly equal we know what happened in game seven uh, we 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 repeat for a couple of moves and we're that much closer now to move 40 once we're at move 40 we gain an hour white is for choice in this position white is doing well the game continues this is not going to be a threefold repetition queen c7 only after flicking in those moves on e5 and h2 for a couple now she's looking to hunt the queen side pawns if the a b pawns fall this guy is live and will bolt and how do you deal with this guy you have to kind of just play defense what do you do here is black king excuse me queen f8 queen e7 what does nyoponishi try he doesn't go on the defensive he plays queen h4 a move that he described in a way uh, he, he said it was kind of like a bluff okay this is a losing move queen h4 this rook can be captured but it wasn't there's a concern here for white and the concern is that there's a perpetual check but there really isn't so in the game we don't have queen takes rook but instead the king runs towards the queen side tries to find shelter there but you could get away with taking the rook and you can get out of this perpetual check idea so let's see what this is let's see how far dingleran actually calculated queen takes rook queen e4 check at this point we'd probably have the position repeat a little bit again a flicking in some moves to get to move 40. check here check and the way you get out of the perpetual is by playing rook to e2 in this position if you play king to d1 it's a very clear perpetual check from this point black would be able to play queen b1 check queen e4 check the white king only has one move in each case and there is our perpetual however it is in this position where white could play rook to e2 queen b1 only move king d2 queen b2 how far did he calculate well in the press conference he said that in this position this is about as far as he got now white is winning this if you try to take the bishop there's not going to be a perpetual the king would sneak away in the following way and he is getting to b2 no more checks in fact it'll be white who'll be having some fun very shortly with queen f6 check and next the promotion so white just needs to find this safe ground for the king not easy to do because you don't have to take the bishop in this position black could give a check on d1 and now in order to avoid the perpetual white would have to move the king to the center and allow this rook to be captured with check and now bishop d3 the bishop gets to make its first move maybe hitting at move 40 depending on if the bishop blocked when the queen was on h1 giving check but this could have been uh move 40 bishop to d3 there really aren't any good checks remaining knight d6 is one check the king could go to e5 queen takes bishop and in the end we're able to give check get this second queen white is winning this position what a wild position this is two queens on the board king on e5 it was a bluff you could get away with taking that rook there is no perpetual but that is not so easy to find that sequence there not so easy to play king e4 and allow your rook to be captured with check okay he doesn't take the rook he bolts towards the queen side queen takes g5 wins 
when Zipan is there just in the nick of time defending the rook. King c2, queen e7, white is still for choice, now activating the bishop. And black on this move 34 has to find an only move. Many cases in this game where there are only moves. Knight d4 is the only move. In this position, he does not find it. He goes with e5. What is the point behind knight to d4? It's to cut off the rook from seeing d7. Black is up a pawn currently, so knight d4. How would this play out? Pawn takes knight, rook takes d7. That's a that's two-point pawn. So this was considered the best try to give up uh, the piece just to eliminate that passer on d7. He does not go in for knight d4. He goes with e5. In from here, bishop e4, looking to eliminate the knight, trying to go in to d4 right now. No good, because you can take, and now rook d7 is met with queen takes pawn. Check. White would be winning this position. Okay. After bishop to e4, the knight goes back. And now we have queen takes a. Notice what is maybe one of the points behind scaring this knight back. What is one of the points behind putting the bishop on e4 first? Because when the bishop goes to g2, you would think the idea at this point is to go to c6 and have a changing of the guard. Have the bishop defend the pawn. And in that way, the queen is now free to pick off the a pawn, the b pawn, and then run with the a pawn. But very precise. First, he flicks in bishop e4. The knight goes back. Now, if you do not play bishop e4 first, if let's say you go hunting for a pawn right now, there can follow e4. And there's, there's an idea to play e3 next, which is very strong. In fact, it's saying that black is winning right here. So this is another point we could even say about bishop to e4 at this stage. It's not allowing this pawn to advance straight away. It's trying to first demote the knight before going elsewhere, before going to c6. So bishop e4, very strong move. Knight h6, now queen takes a. Knight g4. And at this point right here, the best move, bishop c6. Defend this pawn and take the B pawn and run with the A pawn is the general plan at that stage. However, he does not play bishop c6. He goes with bishop to f3, trying to inconvenience the knight first. Again, maybe kick it back to h6 and only then go here. But there's a problem. He overlooks something. Knight takes f2. And what do you do? If you take the knight, this pawn's going to fall. He missed that the knight doesn't have to go in reverse. It doesn't have to go to h6. He captured on f2. Rook takes knight, and now the d pawn is going to fall. e4 first. Rook e2. f5. This structure right here is crushing the bishop. He lost his chance here. He missed out on his chance to win. Queen takes b6 follows. Rook takes d7. If queen takes d7, white would now have to find an only move, and that is counterplay against the g6 point. The threat of the queen getting here or here. White would have to play in this position. Rook g2, and basically black has to eventually offer a queen exchange and we get into this ending which is equal okay in this game it's rook takes d7 queen b8 queen d6 out of the pin offering a queen exchange and threatening the bishop you have to exchange queens and what do you do with the bishop at this stage you have to just get rid of it knock out two pawns this one simplifies now into a rook and pawn ending. King f6, rook e8, that 
is the final move of this game. A draw offer was made by Ding Lorin and it was accepted. This one ends peacefully and a big roller coaster of a game. A lot of ups and downs, many opportunities to win, but didn't find the way in the end. Now, if the game continued here, how might it play out? If this pawn runs, we could run with the A pawn. If he continues to run, we could put the rook behind king f5. And we could still run here. At this point, we're ready to maybe save the pawn. So rook a6, king d3. Let's say rook takes a5. And we could have some kind of perpetual check like this. Maybe even think about at this stage playing king e4, king to d5. This pawn is passed, but... The white king is more active and the rook will be ideally placed behind the passed pawn. Now, what is the biggest blunder? Um, the biggest blunder actually has to do with a position in this game right here after move 12. So I'm going to highlight this position right here. So when I'm live streaming these games, there are uh, I'm occasionally consulting with uh, the Lee Chess database. This is something everybody has access to. I believe the biggest blunder uh, is related to this position right here. The fact that this position showed up in the, the match. Uh, what am I getting at here? One game in the Lee Chess database had this very position, and it was not played between two players that are considered to be masters in the Lee Chess database. This is just the general pool and any game played. There's only one game with this very position, and it was played in March of 2023, a rapid game. And it was between these two players right here. The ratings, if you look at the players, uh, these two players, they've played several games together. Uh, this is old news, what I am sharing here. This is public information by now. Um, or this has been public information, and it's old news. The two players we see here uh, are not at that rating level. It is very likely the case that the accounts on Lee Chess right here are actually Dingler in and Richard Rapper. What is this biggest blunder I'm referring to? I believe these are training games that they played on Lee Chess. Why would you do that instead of playing it in private? They're in a really difficult spot right now because this is all known. The games that are played, the training games that they were playing on Lee Chess. And I'm making an assumption. I just think it's very likely that it's uh, Dingler in and Richard Rapper behind these two accounts. And this is additional information for now. Uh, Team Nyapomnishi, you're they're able to now see the training games that were played. One of the games was uh, that move four, the mysterious looking H3 and uh, game two of this match, there were a there bunch of training games between these two players on Lee Chess with H4 in there. The timing of the games played in March of 2023. When the accounts were created, um, it's really, they have a really tough hill to climb. Not only now back a point in the match, but this information is now well known by both teams so i don't know how this is going to play out uh this is a really really big blunder on their part i believe it's uh these two behind the accounts and to to play online training games like this not a not a good idea so it happened that it showed up in a mat in a in this game eight and it pulled everybody's attention to this one game in the database and yeah i don't know where we're going from here but let's have a look at the tail of the tape on this one 
we can see that Ding Liren had his chances in this one. A little dip after d5, but mostly it was uh, white having these chances throughout. Yeah, this one right here was a, a big blunder, queen to h4. There was no perpetual queen h4. He also described as a bit of a bluff. It was a good bluff in the end, as it turns out. He did not end up taking the rook on d8, and by this point, after bishop f3, knight takes f2, it was even Steven from there. This game was probably you know, the lowest accuracy of all the games so far. Plenty of mistakes and blunders in this one, so... Some drama, uh, some drama with this game eight. Uh, I do not know how things are going to play out from this point, but we'll have to wait and find out. Anyhow, feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback to this video in the comment section below. Hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care.